This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the X-Zone Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the x Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember, 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere, 24-7-365. And welcome to the x everyone. My name is Rob McConnell, and for the next four hours, I'm your host and your guide as together we cross the time-space continuum to this place that I call the x It's a place where people dare to believe and dare to be heard. It's a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. And the Exxon comes to you Monday through Friday from 10 p.m. Eastern until 2 a.m. Eastern on the Talkstar Radio Network, Exxon Broadcast Network, UK High Definition Radio, Euro High Definition Radio, Star Cable, and Exxon TV. If you'd like to give us a call, toll free, 1-800-610-7035. My email is exxon at exxonradiotv.com. On MSN Messenger, TV at hotmail.com. And our website, www.exxonradiotv.com. My guest this hour, this first hour of tonight's show, is Mark McCandlish. And uh, first of all, Mark, welcome to the Exxon. Thank you, Rob. I appreciate you having me on. Mark, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, for the last, uh, better part of the last 30 years or so, I've worked as a conceptual artist in the defense and aerospace industries uh, of the United States. Mm -hmm. And... um, for a few other um, countries also. Um, it's been pretty exciting. I've had an opportunity to see a lot of different weapon systems, uh, mostly aircraft, but um, uh, there have been a variety of technologies that I've been exposed to. It's It's been a pretty exciting gig. Where did your interest come in uh, as as far as getting into the work you're, uh, you've done, you're into now? Uh, do you have an interest in science? Do you have an interest in astronomy? Yes, um, Maybe it was uh, growing up as a military dependent and being around uh, the military environment. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was always a sense the technology was sort of uh, uh, a an integral part of day-to-day living in the military. Uh, being on Air Force bases uh, most of my life as a young adult uh, and as a kid – uh, and being exposed to that kind of thing, it just I think it just sort of spurred that interest on, um, mostly starting with things like um, paleontology, geology, and uh, later astronomy, uh, getting a telescope mm-hmm. and looking at the sky and that kind of thing. I understand that you also used to work for General Dynamics. Yeah, I worked there for a couple of years there in Pomona, California. And um, at the time, they were... Uh, working up the development program for a uh, system called Phalanx, which is a uh, um, radar slave gun system that was mm-hmm. designed to protect uh, ships in the U.S. Navy. And they were also working on a, uh, a proposal for a, uh, an anti-aircraft gun system mounted on a tank chassis, which was referred to as the Divisional Air Defense Tank or DIVAD tank. So got a chance to climb all over these systems, see how they worked, and learn the learn the technology that was involved in those kinds of things. But, um, yeah, it was pretty exciting. Tell me, UFOs, extraterrestrials, in your opinion, are they real? Absolutely, yeah. There's no doubt in my mind. Um, after the, some of the things that I've seen over the last uh, 20 years or so, mm-hmm. um, I don't have any doubts whatsoever. Interesting. You said that very quick, very decisive. Uh, yes, I have no doubt. Have you ever seen a UFO? And I'm not talking about one that is from 
let's say, a, a secret military project? I, I'm talking about the kind that people say come from outer space. Well, that's the one thing that's most difficult for anybody who mm-hmm. sees something like this. You can recognize the strangeness and the uniqueness of the performance capabilities that you see in these aircraft. Yes. Um, but it's really impossible to tell um, where they're from. Um, in reality, they, they could all be part of some secret military development program. But um, some of the things, things that I've seen have been so, uh, so obviously – advanced that it would be really hard to put your finger on it and say yeah it looks like an air force bird you know all right mark stand by you and i have to take a two-minute commercial break mark mccandlish is our special guest www.markmccandlish.com m-a-r-k-m-c-c-a-n-d-l-i-s-h.com my name's rob mcconnell this is the x-zone and uh, we're coming to you from our studios in hamilton ontario canada i'll be back on the other side of this two-minute break as we continue don't go away Take a step back in time and discover old Florida cuisine at Marsh Landing Restaurant in Felsmere. Enjoy delicacies such as frog legs, gator tail, catfish, and swamp cabbage, or enjoy the more traditional cuisine like hand-cut Angus steaks, ribs, and seafood. Join us for breakfast with a southern flair featuring sweet potato pancakes, biscuits and gravy, and much more. Planning a party? Marsh Landing's private dining room can accommodate groups from 8 to 80 people. While you're visiting, enjoy the historic pictures, artifacts, and stories that line the walls. Marsh Landing is truly a unique experience. Marsh Landing Restaurant, 44 North Broadway in historic Felsmere. Or visit marshlandingrestaurant.com. Marsh Landing, old Florida cuisine at its best. Are you interested in the paranormal, ghosts, UFOs, or psychic phenomenon? Join me, Tim Bartley, co-host of Talking to Spirits with Lightworkers Tim and Justina, coming mid-January 2017 to the XZBN. We will channel spirits live and talk to them, revealing all kinds of amazing information. Spiritual attachments will be found and removed on the show, and so much more. To find out when you can listen to Talking to Spirits with Lightworkers Tim and Justina, visit www.xzbn.net for listeners on both sides of the veil. Explanation. Mark McCandlish is our special guest. And uh, Mark, does the United States government have advanced propulsion systems, uh, per- perhaps some night that even get us interstellar capability? Well, I've certainly seen plenty of evidence that they do. Um, some of the things that I was directly involved in um, were uh, high-speed uh, hypersonic air breathers, mm-hmm. um, more conventional. But um, I had an awful lot of contact with people um, from Lockheed and other defense contractors that indicated that we had not only um, a, a high-speed um, air-breathing uh, type of vehicle that was out there, and not only um, being experimented with and tested, but also some that were in deployment uh, around, the, uh, around the world, uh, but also uh, a kind of field propulsion, anti-gravity, if you will, um, that's been on the drawing board since the late 50s, uh, apparently they had some breakthroughs in the early 1960s and had something working by about uh, 1965, 66. Hmm. You know, uh, mainstream scientists uh, scoff at the idea of off-world or alien civilizations having the ability to traverse the vast difference distances between stars. But is it possible, Mark? And if so, how? Well, that's a great question, Rob. Um, Yes, uh, it is. And, um, you know, people think in terms of rocket ships here on this planet. It's mm-hmm. what we've seen for most, uh, most of the last uh, half century. And, um, but the real key to being able to travel those incredible distances between two stars is 
really dependent on being able to find the energy you're using to power your propulsion system right in the environment itself. It would be kind of like finding a way to use solar power from all the stars around you as a power source. And so that's really what this technology is based on, is using uh, pressures or, I should say, uh, energy forms in the environment that can be converted into a propulsive force, and that's how they work. And so the real real question boils down to how fast can you go with a system like that? Now, back around 1994, there was a gentleman, a a scientist over in the UK by the name of Miguel Alcubierre, who wrote a a paper about um, the theory behind uh, a warp drive system, something like the kind of technology that was envisioned by Gene Roddenberry in his Star Trek TV series. Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, he was proposing that you know, one of the things that Einstein had always talked about was that it was really impossible to accelerate up to or beyond the speed of light because as you do so, your the mass of your vehicle increases. It increases exponentially to the point where you simply cannot have enough fuel to continue accelerating or propelling the craft forward. Well, the reason that that was true, and you'll find that mass itself is a variable quantity as you accelerate it increases the mass of your vehicle. As you decelerate, that process reverses itself. So we know that mass is is a variable effect. It's not so much a quantity. It's not like the weight of your vehicle increases. It's just that the, the force resisting further acceleration increases. And part of the reason for that is that there is an energy form embedded right in the fabric of space-time. The technical term is quantum zero-point fluctuations of the vacuum. Uh, otherwise known as zero-point energy. It's also been called scalar waves, longitudinal waves, uh, psychotronic energy. You hear a lot of different terminology, but mm-hmm. basically it's, it's an energy form that's embedded in the environment, and it's responsible for the effect of mass. In fact, you know, when we were going through school and studying physics and things like that in, in high school and other uh, educational forums, um, one of the things that was never really explained, you know, when you talk about the laws of thermodynamics, uh, entropy being one of them, things tend to slow down because of friction and forces in the environment like gravity or, or wind resistance, what have you. But it was never explained to any of us why it is that the subatomic particles in the, the atom, like the electrons that are spinning around the nucleus of the atom, there's, there's no indication that entropy or this, these frictional forces that would slow things down, there's no evidence that any of these kinds of things affect the structure of the atom. In fact, the atom itself is a perfect model of what would be called a perpetual motion device. And the reason for that is because it's drawing the same zero-point energy out of the environment. That is literally what keeps all of the structure of the atom in motion all the time, why it never slows down and never stops. Now, imagine, if you will, that you have this, this little device sitting in front of you on the desk that looks like a little solar system. It's a model of the atom. You have a nucleus in the center that has protons and neutrons in it, which are also spinning and turning and things Mm -hmm. like that. You have the electrons around the outside that are all moving, but if you're able to measure the mass of that atomic structure, you find that it has one value at its steady state um, uh, point. Uh, It's where it's at rest, so to speak. Um, but as you begin to move that through the environment, an environment that's extremely rich with this energy, uh, all those components begin to spin and move faster. It's literally as though it's gathering more and more energy as it travels through the environment. It would be the same as if you're walking slowly through a rainstorm. It's sprinkling and you get a little wet, but if you sit on the roof of a car that's moving 60 miles an hour, you get drenched even though the dis- dispersant or the, the dispersal of the raindrops is is the same. Mm-hmm. And so that's basically what Einstein was saying, is as you move through the environment, you gather more energy, the components inside the atom begin to become more energized, and as a result, they exhibit a higher mass. So the propulsion systems that we're talking about are actually drawing that energy out of the environment, and, and you know, energy is conserved, so to speak, because you're actually using it to create propulsive force. So the faster you go, the more energy there is available for you to continue doing this. But the end result is that the mass of your vehicle becomes less and less as you go faster and faster. And so as you approach the speed of light, you have uh, nearly an infinite amount of energy you can draw from where your mass is probably less than it would be in your steady state condition where it's not moving at all. 
So in a sense, the vehicle becomes light as a feather and you have practically the entire power of the universe driving you, pushing you forward. So at that point, breaking the light barrier really becomes a reality. Son of a gun. How close are we to this technology or does it already exist? It already exists. And, um, you know, when you, when you look at what they were actually calling uh, the early prototypes of this uh, technology, the alien reproduction vehicle, it, mm-hmm. it becomes pretty obvious that uh, at least to the insiders that uh, were involved in this at Lockheed and other defense contractors, that they probably back-engineered something from a, uh, a vehicle that uh, was from another star system that crashed here on this planet. You know, being machines, this is the one thing that most people don't really consider. You know, you you think about any civilization that might be advanced enough to build a machine that could actually come here in the in, a, in the flesh. Um, that just like our cars that are manufactured on a production line, um, some have flaws. You know, some somebody might have made a mistake somewhere on the production line, and uh, here they are, you know, light years away from home, and they have a flat tire. And the next thing you know, one of our guys comes along and says, hey, I want what you've got. And they take it and try to take it apart if they can get it apart and figure out what makes it work. And that's what the basis, uh, that's, that's really what back engineering is all about. What is your opinion of the Roswell crash of 1947? Well, from the things that I've heard uh, within the defense and aerospace uh, community, um, it really happened. Um, You know, there's been a lot of uh, diversionary tactics employed by the military and the U.S. government to suggest that it was a uh, uh, special balloon that would send uh, detectors aloft to see whether some of our uh, political competitors around the globe were testing nuclear weapons and things of that nature. And another one involves some, uh, um, well, what, what the military has as the uh, uh, kind of a crash test dummy for right. uh, aircraft ejections and things like that, um, which they were using to account for some of the bodies back in the, uh, the early 1990s, I think it was. But, um, you know, I, I really believe that, um, you know, not only did it happen, but mm-hmm. that um, it's been one of probably 70 different crashes that have occurred over the last 65 to 70 years. So tell me, why do you think the government of the United States and other governments of the world are suppressing the information and, can, you know, perpetrating a conspiracy and cover-up to the citizens of the world if, in fact, these craft – have visited us from other planets and that we're using the technology that was back engineered from them. Why, why the secrecy? That's a great question, Rob. Um, I, I have to say, uh, you know, as someone who had a, a, a security classification of secret for mm-hmm. a time, both in the military and later working with uh, uh, a number of defense contractors, that, uh, you know, when you've got an ace in the hole with a, a technology that is is so incredibly advanced beyond uh, what your contemporaries around the world are using. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you if you have a propulsion system that can take you from point A to point B on the globe in under ten minutes uh, inside the atmosphere, not producing a sonic boom, um, in many cases uh, invisible on radar, and use that propulsion system as a weapons platform. You've got something that gives you such a tremendous advantage strategically and tactically um, that you you never want to shine the light of day on something like that because, you know, it's obvious that once the existence of something like this is known for a fact, everyone else is going to be out there trying to figure out how you did it, right? How how you were able to build it, you know, what the technology is, how it works. So basically, it's an it's a matter of national security. It really is, but you know. The, the flip side of all of this is that the technology that's employed in this propulsion system also happens to be uh, one of the most efficient and one of the most um, – uh, unha- well, a, a system that would not be harmful to the environment um, if it was employed at a low energy level. You know, we are not you know, warping the mm-hmm. fabric of space and time around the power production system. Uh, but you can produce a tremendous amount of energy with these systems um, and – the only downside is that you have to keep it within certain limits because as you do so, the actual mass of the power production facility begins to become reduced. Even working in the vicinity of something like this, you'll have the sensation of uh, being able to move more freely, more easily, but it's almost like being weightless in one sense 
because um, it, you're drawing the very energy out of the environment that's responsible for your sensation of mass, your sensation of weight. Mark, stand by. Very interesting conversation. Thanks very much for joining us here on the Exxon. Exxon Nation, Mark McCandlish is our special guest. His website is www.markmccandlish.com. That's M-A-R-K-M-C-C-A-N-D-L-I-S-H. Dot com. We'll be back on the other side of this news break as the Exxon continues from our studios in beautiful Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. My name is Rob McConnell. Don't go away. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the X-Zone Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the X-Zone Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere. 24-7-365. Exonation, Mark McCandlish is our special guest. His website is www.markmccandlish.com. Mark, is it possible that some of the weaponry that you and I have been talking about for the last half hour have actually been used in conflict scenarios around the world? And is it also possible, Mark, that the majority of UFO sightings that people are reporting are actually these craft in flight? Well, I think that there's uh, a fair amount of evidence that there is. Um, da- back in the early 1990s, um, Right uh, at the point where we were engaged in the uh, Persian Gulf War, mm-hmm. um, I had uh, friends whose uh, husbands and wives and things were over in deployment in the Middle East. Um, it was a young lady that worked at a local uh, fast food restaurant that I frequented at the time whose uh, husband was a Marine on board one of the ships over in the uh, Persian Gulf. And he would write home. Uh, some of his letters had some things that were redacted or blacked out in the process of being sent back to the United States. But she said that he was talking about some of these uh, strange lights in the sky that would uh, zip across the sky and stop on a dime or would uh, traverse the sky making right angle turns uh, in the process, uh, never slowing down. Um, and uh, things that would look like stars for all intents and purposes and then suddenly just move away at a tremendous clip. So um, I made a point of um, having a, a chance to talk to this lady's husband when he came back. He's a very, very nice young man. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, he said that they were seeing these things all the time and it was obvious to the people on the ships and the people in the field that um, the military operations there in the Persian Gulf were being observed and being observed very intently um, on a daily and nightly basis. Um, And uh, there were rumors, although I don't know how much credence you can uh, give to these rumors, that uh, some of these propulsion systems were employed uh, in fighting the Republican Guard um, from Iraq um, in the early stages of the conflict. And... um, you know, I I heard stories about uh, you know high energy weapon systems being used to wipe out complete platoons of troops and things like that. I don't know if they're true. I imagine if any of that stuff happened, that it's it's so highly classified that uh, there's just no way you'll ever know until you know many mm-hmm. many years in the future from now. But uh, you know, you, the other part of your question was um, you know. Um, are we really deploying technology like this? And, and I, I believe that we are. Um, 
it, it has tremendous advantages for surveillance more than anything else. Um, I think the thing that you have to be careful about uh, if you're a military strategist is that if you're employing systems of this kind, um, you may or may not be able to use the weapons on board without actually slowing down to a point where the weapons can actually um, be uh, sent out from the presence of the vehicle. Uh, when it's moving at you know, something in excess of 9,000 miles an hour, if you toss a missile out the window, it's going to disintegrate. And so very often these things have to stop, deliver the payload, and then get going again at a very fast speed. Um, I just think that um, probably more than anything else, they're being used not only to intimidate but to surveil uh, some of the other um, so-called enemies of the United States. So do you think that these these experimental craft or these craft that are actually being used in conflicts presently will ever be declassified? Well, my hope is that someday they will because uh, at some point, mm-hmm. um, you know, these, these kinds of things have to be um, – brought out into uh, into the uh, the white world so to speak as opposed to black you know secret technologies um, um, not only because of the environmental concerns that we're having now because of fossil fuels and things of that nature but because you know you just can't dam up every stream and river for hydroelectric power you can't uh, you know put miles and square miles of of solar cells out in the desert I mean they're having uh, a lot of um, controversy here in California right now because there are vast areas of the Southern California desert that uh, a number of companies want to put up these uh, solar uh, energy collection sites. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, they've got everything from the desert tortoise to, uh, you know, the kangaroo rat that the environmentalists are worried about, you know, their habitat being destroyed yeah. by these projects. And, and so you know, s- sooner or later, they're going to have to at least begin to declassify some of the technology, admit that this technology um, exists so that, um, you know, there can be a learning curve within the society um, so that people can start looking outside the box, as it were, and uh, and, and try to figure out ways to exploit these technologies that are non-weaponized. If this te- technology does exist, Mark, why isn't it being used uh, for the space program? In- instead of using solid rocket boosters, if the if the technology is there, why not start it off with the with the um, with the space program? It would be a lot easier to break it to the John Q. public if the public thought that NASA developed it. And this way, here the uh, the other arms of the government could actually maintain national security. Well, I think that it is and it has been used um, uh, in part of our so-called secret space program. Um, There seems to be some evidence that such a program may go back uh, several decades. Mm -hmm. Um, I remember talking to one of the other Disclosure Project witnesses back in 2001. It was a young man who said that uh, he was brought in to repair some photographic equipment that was uh, uh, having some kind of a little system failure. Uh, at Langley, uh, where the CIA is based, and uh, noticed that there were a number of um, uh, diplomats from other countries that were gathered in this room looking at some photographs spread around a table, and these photographs had been taken by a, uh, an early uh, moon orbiting um, satellite that uh, photographed what appeared to be fully developed bases on the back side of the moon. So I think that you know, e- even within the highest levels of the U.S. intelligence apparatus, uh, and the, the government, that there are uh, organizations, agencies, if you will, that are so highly classified even beyond that that uh, perhaps even the President of the United States doesn't know about them. But yes, I think that um, it has been used. I know that NASA right now has a uh, kind of a contest going on mm-hmm. with uh, uh, the invitation being for uh, inventors and people of that nature to uh, try and come up with ideas for creating these advanced propulsion systems. You probably heard about the Advanced Propulsion Technology Symposium that's been put on by Mark Millis yes. in uh, I think it's Columbus, or Ohio, one of, or Cincinnati. I'm not sure where it is exactly, but but uh, you know this is this is the problem is because most mainstream physicists scoff at the idea of this kind of technology even being possible. That uh, 
uh, you know, I, uh, I've corresponded with a few physicists um, who uh, will, will laugh and say, oh, it's not even wrong. You know, that's simply impossible. But it's only because they're coming at the, the problem uh, with, you know, all the standard texts that were taught, you know, at the college level and beyond um, as a basis for their understanding of, of this kind of technology. They just, they just simply do not believe that it exists. And so as long as the population, particularly the, the mainstream scientific community, uh, will not accept that, you know, you can, you can achieve these kinds of capabilities, uh, you're going to see a lot of resistance. You'll, it's very difficult to get funding for someone. Uh, I mean, you know, I've, I've had offers from some people who, uh, you know, want to know, uh, you know, well, if you if you had the money, could you build something like this? And and chances are, I could probably get a really uh, a pretty a pretty uh, long ways down the road uh, towards doing just that. I may not have all of the uh, the technical know-how or the mathematical understanding of uh, you know how you would put together something like this, but I can tell you that from everything that I've gathered over the last twenty years regarding this technology. Um, I have a pretty good idea not only uh, what the materials usage is, what the orientation of the components would be uh, to make a system like this work because I've talked to so many people who've actually had hands-on experience or have parents or relatives who've, who've had hands-on experience in working on things like this. So there's no doubt in my mind it exists. It's really just a matter of, you know, putting together a team and a group of people that would be able to, uh, to figure out all of these little questions that need to be answered on how you would do it. So where does the government or the military keep all these super-secret prototypes or super-secret aircraft? Well, with the advent of satellite surveillance on both sides of the continent, or both sides of the world, I should say, um, you know, you, you really can't leave these things out in the open, mm -hmm. uh, especially at the daytime. Um, I think this is probably one of the reasons why uh, there are so many vehicles that are misidentified or thought of as being, you know, triangles or UFOs or what have you. People see lights in the sky, and uh, you know, if it's a long ways off, I mean, it could be anything from the planet Jupiter or Venus to, uh, you know, a shooting star. And and in fact, most of these things uh, that I've seen were operational at night. Uh, which makes it really difficult to sort of uh, discriminate between whether or not what you're looking at is a conventional aircraft or a meteor or uh, just, you know, a, a very high speed uh, but very advanced conventional propulsion system. So, you know, most of the activity that's going to happen with a system that's been uh, developed by the military is going to occur mm -hmm. uh, in the dark of night, usually in the wee hours of the morning. Uh, and I would have to say that uh, probably the the most common method of uh, storing and housing these vehicles is underground. Um, I've talked to so many people who've seen, uh, you know, vehicles coming and going from various locations. But, you know, if you get out a powerful telescope and put yourself up on a hill somewhere, you can't see anything on the ground. Um, I've even talked to a lady down in New Mexico who lives not too far from uh, Kirkland Air Force Base, one of the most highly classified installations mm -hmm. that, that we know of that's pretty much out in the open. It's near Albuquerque. Um, she has actually seen vehicles of this type emerging right out of the side of a cliff uh, near where she was camping. Uh, and she said that for all intents and purposes, it looked like this vehicle just flowed right out of the material of the, the cliff itself, just like it was coming out of a... Uh, uh, a big rock colored piece of jello just coming right out wow. of the material and uh, so obviously they have some way of of uh, bending space time so that uh, you know uh, material objects are, are able to be penetrated or at mm -hmm. least you create the illusion that there's a material cliff there uh, when in fact it might be some kind of a holographic projection or an image that uh, obscures a, a tunnel opening or something like that in all the years that you've been doing what you do, Mark, what has been the most amazing, I mean the most amazing craft that you yourself have witnessed? Well, um, it was uh, De December 13th, 1989. Well, there have been several. I think this was probably the, the first and most dramatic sighting that I had. Um, 
uh, oddly, I had um, spent an evening at the home of someone claiming an abduction experience on the 11th of December 1989 and had some really strange things happen there. And two nights later, um, I was out for the evening with my girlfriend celebrating our anniversary. And um, we were sitting at a traffic light right near the Ontario airport, and that's in Southern California, not mm-hmm. Canada. Um, looking north uh, to a mountain range that's just north of that community. And um, as we're sitting at this traffic light on a freeway overpass, out of the corner of my eye, I saw this brilliant bluish-white ball of light uh, coming up from the southeast, traveling at a tremendous velocity. I I kind of plotted the uh, the time to distance uh, on a map, you know, from point A to point B in, you know, half a second. And it turned out that this thing was traveling something on the order of 9,000 miles an hour, at least relative to the ground. Um, had uh, a very obvious um, mm-hmm. glowing ionization trail behind it, and it, it came right down in front of the mountain range there, right near Mount Baldy and some of the surrounding uh, mountains in the, uh, I guess it's the Angeles, Los Angeles uh, mountain range. Um, and it, it made a right angle turn in front of the mountains, um, ran parallel to the front of the mountain, so it was basically crossing in front of me, and then made another right angle turn, climbed slightly, and then it began zigzagging down through a canyon um, right near uh, Mount Baldy. Um, now, if you take a look at Google Earth, and this is right in the vicinity of a, a community called Rancho Cucamonga. There really is a place called Rancho Cucamonga. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but that particular canyon uh, moves straight north and actually comes right out uh, of the mountain range just south of uh, Edwards Air Force Base. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's – but this, this entire thing that I saw was probably about one and a half seconds long. And it traveled all that distance, and it was so fast that if you'd blinked, you would have missed it. Mark, stand by. You and I have to take our final break for this hour. Rick's own nation, our very special guest this hour, Mark McCandlish. His website, filled with information, www.markmccandlish.com. That's M-A-R-K-M-C-C-A-N-D-L-I-S-H.com. My name's Rob McConnell. This is The Exxon. We'll be back after this break. Don't you dare go away. Hi, I'm Larry Lawson, host of Paranormal Stakeout. With over 36 years in law enforcement, I have learned a few things. The most important is the proper gathering and preservation of evidence is vital to putting the bad guy behind bars. It's no different in the world of paranormal investigation, whether it's the search for the afterlife, cryptozoology, UFOs, and extraterrestrials. How we gather the evidence, preserve that evidence, and present it to a jury of our peers will make the ultimate difference in proving the existence of worlds and entities that are beyond our imagination. Join me, Larry Lawson, every week on Paranormal Stakeout when, along with my guests, we'll take a journey to prove with indisputable evidence what man has struggled to believe for centuries. Go to xzbn.net for the broadcast schedule and check me out at paranormalstakeout.com true healing must address four levels physical emotional mental and spiritual for us to live joyful and productive lives We tend to treat three of the four, leaving the spiritual languishing. If you're tired of the same dysfunctional patterns cropping up in your life, soul balancing is for you. Trixie Phelps, owner and founder of Soul Balancing, is a naturally gifted energy healer trained in numerous esoteric forms, including shamanism. Trixie has created a powerful modality that safely and effectively clears your energetic field. A soul balancing session can remove interference, heal trauma, and restore your hope. Contact Trixie for a life-changing long-distance session today, www.soulbalancing.world. You're listening to the X-Zone Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. X-Zone Nation, Mark McCandlish is our special guest once again, www.markmccandlish.com is his website. Mark, what else have you seen? Now you've got my curiosity up. Well, I um, 
I've actually seen a couple of occasions where the phenomenon that I observed um, really seemed to represent what might be described as uh, the employment of traversable wormholes. I've seen this on several occasions, and it's it's a, a very startling kind of event. Um, yeah, in this was in uh, June or July of 1993 in Southern California. I was coming back from an Angels baseball game. I was on uh, Route 91, um, southwest of the community of Chino, um, and uh, saw a, uh, a brilliant flash of light in the sky, and then a, uh, a glowing sphere, kind of fuzzy, fuzzy edges around it that got larger and larger as it was descending at about a 45 degree angle. Just appeared out of nowhere. But what was really strange about that was that following directly behind it was a series of parallel gold-colored glowing lines. And they were all of the exact same length, all parallel to one another. And they were of different – the lines were of different weight. Some were thin, pencil-thin lines. Others were thick and brighter. And it wasn't until I really thought about it later that I realized what I was looking at was uh, sort of – Imagine if you have a tube of of space time that goes back to another point of origin out in space, and as you as you may remember from the Star Wars movie, as they make the jump to light speed, all of the yeah. the dots that represent the stars out there start s- spreading out into these streaks that kind of converge on a vanishing point out in the distance, and that's really what I was looking at, but in reverse, I was looking back through the wormhole. And the reason that these lines all had a gold color to them was that the white colored light of the stars had redshifted into more of a golden hue. And, and, but the funny thing was is that the images of these stars was being carried along with the physical presence of the vehicle. And that was what was so striking. In fact, the first time I saw this, I thought, my God, you know, there's been an airplane, a midair collision or explosion. And, you know, mm-hmm. these are f- flaming particles of debris that are falling behind yeah. it. The fact was is that they, they weren't flaming or trailing smoke or anything. They were all these per- – they looked like individual gold-colored fluorescent light tubes that were in a pattern that was fixed and they were moving along with this thing as it descended behind a mountain in the distance. Now, more recently, as recently as a year ago, up here in Redding, California, where I, I live now, there have been a lot of rumors of about a, uh, an underground UFO base under a, uh, a mountain west of uh, Red Bluff, which is south of me, um, called Thompson Mountain. Talked to a lot of people who've had sightings out there and, and people who said they've seen these tremendous flashes of light. Uh, and then after the flash dissipates, there'd be this little point of light there that would suddenly just shoot off like it had been fired out of a gun. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and it obviously seems as though uh, these are uh, basically uh, vehicles of you know, some unknown origin that are uh, materializing right out of the fabric of space-time. Basically, it, it would seem as though... They're coming from a place where there's a tremendous amount of light, maybe a star system where there's a tremendous amount of illumination in the local environment. And as that portal opens up, there's this tremendous release of light from from that point in the sky, and then the object uh, zips away. Hey, Mark, we've run out of time for tonight. Love to have you back in the near future. I do thank you very much for joining us. Well, and, thank uh, you. You're welcome. Nice talking to you, Mark. Take care of yourself. Exonation, markmccandlish.com is the website. That's www.markmccandlish.com. I'll be back after the news at six o'clock, at six and a half minutes past the hour as we continue here in the Exxon. Don't go away.